Titans, plagues, and mad monarchs. Oh my! The medieval times certainly were a terrifying time to be alive, whether they knew it or not at the time. Let's waste no time and dive right on in. Here are the top 10 unsettling, scary stories from medieval times. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Pope Gregory the Ninth. Pope Gregory the Ninth was the Bishop of Rome and the ruler of the Papal States from 1227 until his passing in 1241. The Papal States were a series of territories in the Italian Peninsula that were under direct rule of the Pope from the 8th century all the way to 1870. It turns out that Pope Gregory the Ninth had a very strange hatred for cats. He said that black cats were actually instruments of Satan, which seems a little extreme, but then he actually went as far as to order that they be exterminated throughout Europe, which is definitely a little extreme. With this order, the Pope's followers had to oblige, and there was a drastic reduction in the cat population. But of course, this caused a disturbance to the ecosystem, and the time and the consequence of that became very evident. Because of the decline of cats, there was a sudden increase in the amount of rats, most of which may have been carrying the plague. There are a lot of historians who would argue that this war on cats may have had a huge effect on the severity of the Black Plague. That is, of course, speculation as it's pretty difficult to pinpoint who could be at fault for something like that, but it certainly is a very interesting point. This all really does, however, bring me to my next point. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Black Death. I'm sure we've all heard of the Black Death at some point or another. I mean, how could we possibly ever stop talking about something like that? During the 1340s, there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague that spread rapidly throughout Europe and Asia. It was called the Black Plague because of the fact that this illness would cause people's lymph nodes to to become swollen and black. The Black Death was absolutely terrible and it caused a lot of agony for those who had to go through it. Symptoms included things like severe body aches, fever, vomiting, and eventual death in most cases. There was no cure for the plague, so it just continued to spread. In the end, the Black Death took the lives of hundreds of millions of people. We now all know firsthand what it is like to live through a pandemic, and I certainly wouldn't sign up to do it again anytime soon, so I'm most definitely sure the times of the Black Death were some of the worst times in history. Apparently it is said that if you lived in the 1340s, there was basically a 50-50 chance that you'd survive the Black Death. And then on top of that, there's all of the other horrifying ways to die that the medieval times held. All in all, I'm kind of shocked that we're still here today. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Mongol invasion. Being in China during the Mongol invasion certainly was a terrifying time. I'm sure a lot of us here have heard at least some of the stories surrounding Genghis Khan, but if you haven't, let's just say that being on his bad side certainly wasn't a good thing for you. In 1205, when the Mongol invasion in China began, it was the regular citizens of China who paid the ultimate price. What was started by Genghis Khan was carried on by his son and then his grandson, which ultimately led to a 74 year long campaign that was filled with brutality and destruction. Cities and towns were destroyed, empires were brought down, and millions of completely innocent people lost their lives. It is believed that this invasion took the lives of enough people to cut the population in half from 120 million before to just 60 million after. Anyone living in China at this time would have had to live in absolute fear of being killed for something that you really had nothing to do with. That would be awful and absolutely terrifying. In our number 7 spot today, we have Pope Formosus and Pope Stephen VI. Pope Formosus was the ruler of the Papal States from October 6th, 891 until he passed away on April 4th, 896. After his passing, Pope Boniface Face the sixth took his place as ruler for just a few weeks before he also passed away, which then left Pope Stephen the sixth as the ruler from then on until his death. After this whirlwind April of 1896, things got even weirder. Before his passing, Pope Formosus had sided with Arnulf of Corinthia against Lambert of Spoleto, which was definitely not okay with Pope Stephen VI. So once Pope Stephen VI gets to the place of being the ruler, he gets the people to exhume the body of Pope Formosus so that he can put him on trial. I feel like this is very gross and very unnecessary, but this really is the type of stuff that went on in the 800s. They propped the body up for trial and had a deacon and Answer questions for him since he obviously was unable to do that himself. They ended up finding the corpse guilty, which seems a little unfair, and they actually went as far as to strip the body of its sacred vestments, took three fingers from the right hand as they were the blessing fingers, they dressed the body in regular people clothes instead of the clothing a pope would be buried in, and then they reburied the body. If this poor man's body hadn't been through enough, it was later re-exhumed 
again and thrown into the river. If this story wasn't already wild enough, this whole debacle is actually what would later end up getting Pope Stephen imprisoned and then killed. All right, so I guess the other Pope had his justice in the end. I don't know, man. In our number six spot today, we have King Charles VI. King Charles VI started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him hacking up knights, imagining that he was Saint George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was completely abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances blocked off. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. In our number five spot today, we have the Italian Renaissance dark side. Just at the tail end of the years of the medieval period, as we transitioned into the Renaissance period, began the Italian Renaissance. When we think of the Italian Renaissance period, it is known for the development and the rebirth that it caused, which makes a lot of sense considering the word Renaissance means rebirth. But there is one less glamorous and slightly frightening side to this period that isn't always spoken about. Sailors who had been returning from the New World at this point brought something less than lovely back with them, and that was syphilis, which spread through an entire French army. After this, the troops brought what was called the Great Pox to the rest of Europe. Since there was no penicillin back then, the disease spread rapidly and the symptoms were pretty gruesome. It would often happen that the person who had fallen ill would have the skin on their faces essentially be rotting away, which would leave large ulcers. Sometimes people's noses or lips would be pretty much gone, and it happened often that people would very sadly pass away from the disease. So basically, what we think of as a really beautiful time in Europe was both world changing, but also very scary and like, I don't know, kind of close to a zombie apocalypse. In our number four spot today, we have William the Conqueror. In 1087, William the Conqueror decided to take on an all alcohol diet. This is because he was suffering from extreme obesity and was struggling because of that fact. Because of this, he told his staff that he would only drink wine until his weight went down, but he ended up passing away less than a year later. And most of us are told that obviously this was because of the wine only diet. That's actually not true. In an astonishing turn of events, this wine only diet actually worked. Shortly after beginning his diet, he was able to ride his horse again, which was one of the main reasons he started the diet in the first place, as he was previously too heavy for the horse to carry. He actually died after falling from his horse during an expedition, which was completely unrelated to either his weight or his diet. It's entirely possible that had he not gone on this diet, he would have never ridden his horse and maybe would have lived longer? Truthfully, who knows? But I suppose in a very roundabout way, he did still kind of die from his wine only diet. In our number three spot today, we have Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed and during the time her son was too young to rule just yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out by using scalding hot water. Yeah. Don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it really doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. It seemed like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slang, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from. She divided a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she definitely was not okay. In our number two spot today, we have Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was a deputy to the ruler of the Mali Empire, but when the ruler went missing while on a sea voyage to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, Mansa Musa became the ruler in 1312. 
During his rule, European nations were really struggling due to civil wars and a lack of resources, but the Mali Empire was flourishing because of their abundance of resources like gold and salt. Under his rule, the empire grew to take up a large portion of West Africa as he conquered 24 cities and their surrounding districts. At this time, Mali was one of the top producers of gold in the entire world, which left Mansa Musa as one of the wealthiest historical figures ever. One of the most well known events during his rule was the pilgrimage to Mecca. This journey took place from 1324 to 1325 and spanned an estimated 4,000 miles, and it was the first time people outside of the empire saw just how wealthy he was. He traveled with 60,000 of his men, all wearing Persian silk, along with 12,000 slaves who each carried four pounds of gold bars, and he also brought heralds who had golden staffs, along with a bunch of camels and horses. This pilgrimage had a profound effect on Egypt as this huge group of people passed through. From the markets in Cairo, to the royals, to the impoverished people that crossed their path, Musa left Cairo littered with so much gold that it depreciated the value of the metal in Egypt and it took decades for them to recover. In our number one spot today, we have St. Marcellus's Flood. This was actually a very serious extra tropical cyclone that swept through around January 16th, 1362. This cyclone eerily matched up with the new moon and it spanned through the British Isles, the Netherlands, Northern Germany, and Denmark. Here's the thing, this storm not only lined up with the moon, but also peaked on the feast day of St. Marcellus, which is the reason it got its name, but usually people refer to this one as the second because there is another. The first St. Marcellus flood took the lives of 36,000 people as it swept through the Northern Netherlands in 1219. The second flood, however, while no one is sure the exact numbers, it is estimated that at least 250,000 people lost their lives. While there have been plenty of devastating floods in history, this one is said to be blamed on Atlantic gales and that this event goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. Alright guys, that has been our list for today. Thanks so much for checking it out. I've been your host today, Olivia Kozlowski, and I will see you all again soon. Bye!